Hello, welcome to the Water Bearing Workshop. My name is Marty, um, and this is the third video in a series on how we're making a, a new stainless steel version of the Unispout. We're working on the back plate, um, and this one will be about machining the mold. Uh, so I've essentially got the new back plate redesigned. Uh, I turned that into a mold design um, and uh, picked up some material from the metal supplier. Oh, my goodness Ugh. there we go there's a nice 12 by 12 by what is it two and a quarter thick yeah thereabouts a uh, sheet of aluminum we're gonna cut this into uh, smaller sections and turn that into a mold and oh yeah I got a couple of these too so there you go that'll do it so step one um, turn these into smaller blocks of aluminum that I can um, Stick in the CNC machine and turn into a mold. Um, actually, it's not going to quite work that simply, but some of the skips, um, steps will skip. Won't quite show all, everything on the video because, frankly, they're boring and uh, it's, I'm not a good machinist, so this is not about machining anyway. Um, so with that, uh, cut this into a smaller piece, square it up, uh, do some uh, machining on it, We'll get uh, three separate pieces for the mold, put them together, test them, see how they work, and then go from there. So with that, here away we go. Okay, first step, gotta cut this bad boy into a smaller hunk. So we'll just put it in the vise here. Huh? Ooh, yo, yo, yo. All right, yeah, okay. Give that a good crunk, all right. Got a brand new hacksaw blade. Can you hear that? Nice. And away we go. Of course it might take me a while, so I'll be right back. I'm not gonna cut that with a hacksaw. That's just silly. <laughs> That's just me goofing off. Anyway. Uh, I'm thankful that uh, I have some nice machinery to work with, um, and this is my latest acquisition. It's a, it's a bandsaw, and, and it will quite honestly make short work of this uh, two-inch plus thick piece of aluminum. Um, it's huge, uh, but it's sort of at the intersection of uh, what I could afford and what's available. So here it is in the shop, and I'm just going to use it to cut this uh, piece of aluminum into uh, what I need. So with that. Away we go. All right, there it is. One piece ready for some squaring up. Okay, I'm here at the uh, milling machine. I got my piece of aluminum ready. Um, and essentially what I'm gonna do is just put it in the machine, um, hit the green button, tell the machine to go, to do its thing, and then it'll mill the part. Um, so, you know, just, I got a vise here. Put the piece of metal in there. Make sure it's safe, and then uh, I'm ready to go. Um, that's a bit more involved than that. But uh, I'm using the machine in a particular way. Uh, to, to, my, to my mind, there's two ways that these machines get used. Uh, one is um, they do the same thing over and over and over again. So what you do is you, you put a piece of metal in, you know, you close the door, you hit the green button, the machine does its thing. You know, and then you take the finished piece of metal out. And a lot of our world is made that way. Um, the other way the machine is used is it's computer controlled. So it can make some really complicated parts. Um, parts that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to make on a manual machine. I mean, uh, there's a lathe right over there that I use for some simpler parts, but um, um, I, I couldn't make this by hand. It's just it's too much, it's too complicated. There's, 
uh, slopes and tapers and uh, this thing is designed down to you know the thousandths of an inch so uh, it's not going to happen so I'm using that particular way um, and it's a it's a long involved process it's a complicated part um, I've written a program to, to run it and I've got uh, what is it 23 different operations in there and I'm using 15 different tools to do this. Um, it's going to run about four hours, maybe five. We'll see. Um, and there's a chance that uh, I could have gotten something wrong and screw it up. And it's just a machine. It's going to do what I tell it to do, even if it's wrong. Um, okay, well, and if I did something wrong, then I ruin a piece of material. Maybe I break a cutter. Um, well, okay, that's the way it goes. Um, Worst case, um, I could crash the machine itself. Uh, it could jam this vise into uh, the spindle here, and uh, you know you have one <laughs> immovable object meeting an irresistible one. I don't know. Anyway, it, it's bad news. It it ruined the machine. It'd be very expensive to uh, repair. So hopefully that doesn't happen. I don't want that. Anyhow, um, meh got the metal in here I got a couple of other things to do I need to tell it uh, where the material it is so it can do its thing essentially I'm going to set a, a zero coordinate here at the top um, double check a couple of things and hit the green button and uh, see what happens so with that I hope to see you at the end of this with some with some good results in a mold part so so here we are at the machine watching the uh, I'm watching the second part of that uh, mold being machined. It's uh, really hard to see what's going on in there. The um, spindle's moving up and down and around. The cutter's spinning at about 9,000 RPM and that uh, white milky liquid is uh, what's called coolant. It's um, well, water mixed with a little bit of oil and some other things. It uh, cools the part, but more importantly, it flushes the chips away and keeps the aluminum from sticking to the cutter. And right now the cutter is moving in at, at about 9,000 RPM, you know, taking away small, tiny little bits of material in one of the bosses. And, you know, I'm watching this to make sure everything goes okay. Between that and, you know, the panel, it'll tell me where I'm at and what I'm doing. So, anyway, it's about, uh, you know, four hours of this for this one part. At any rate, got to keep watching. Okay, here we are. I got the uh, mold parts done and here they are in all their shiny aluminum glory. Uh, two parts of the mold that I'm working on. Um, okay, yeah, there's still some work to be done, but uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, what happened here. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to get the first part done. Um, here it is. Um, and here's the, the reason why. Uh, there's a cutter uh, that was that I was using to rough this out and the cutter broke. Um, I, I, I have an MQL system that uh, works with the uh, milling machine. I like using that. It just puts down a, a little small amount of uh, vegetable oil essentially on the, the cutter um, and uh, it works great except this time once the cutter got down into this cavity area the sprayer was not able to get at the tip of the uh, mill the end mill here and mill got gummed up with aluminum and it broke so okay I wasted a eh, what, cutter 40 80 dollars I don't know um, and a um, piece of material <sighs> oh well yeah it's like my dad used to say school mucks on out and yeah this is just another example of that so switched over to uh, flood coolant to mill these parts uh, and here they are Still got some work to do, um, even though um, everything looks shiny and uh, smooth, it's, it's really not that smooth. Uh, it, it needs to get um, cleaned up um, to make it smoother so that um, when it's injected with wax, the uh, wax comes off very easily. And that's particularly important in some of these vertical areas, um, so I'll be doing that. Uh, but before I do, um, let's see, 
let's talk about uh, some of the challenges with this one. I'll bring you up closer. And then we'll also look at, um, how, uh, look at how this was machined um, out of a, just a block of aluminum. And uh, I didn't put the, the, the camera in the, uh, in the machine. It just wasn't going to work out with the flood coolant. But I did take some pictures during the steps so you'll get an idea of, of how this all works. So uh, we'll go look at that. Okay, so the whole milling process starts with this um, block of aluminum that I uh, sawed and squared up. So here it is in the mill, uh, in a vise, ready to go. And the first step is to define the initial shape by just roughing the part out. And, and this is done rather quickly. This uh, took 11 minutes of the four and a half or five hour run time to remove over half of the material so we can get the rough shape of the part. And then that shape was defined, uh, refined further using some... Uh, end mills that uh, have a ball nose or essentially a, a hemisphere on the bottom. And this is allow allows the um, end mill to eat, trace these organic and round curvy shapes a lot easier and get a lot closer. And I think at this point we're uh, about a 32nd of an inch away from the um, final dimensions of the part. And that's just going to get resolved further and further. And so I started from the top. I um, milled the top cylindrical section to its uh, final dimensions and then finish the lower section and then I had to move on to these little finicky little areas these bosses uh, and these take a long time because I've got to use a smaller end mill and that uh, little end mill can only remove uh, small amounts of material at a time so these took a long time to mill and then after that um, there's a flat area this is necessary for uh, the two parts of the mold to mate, uh, this has to be nice and clean. Uh, and then uh, there's some injection sprues that are milled near the top uh, for the wax to travel into the mold. And some holes are drilled. Um, these are for some bolts and dowel pins to hold the two parts of the mold together. And finally, a, a little engraving step. Okay, so from that, I hope you got a sense of uh, uh, how this was done in stages. Um, and sort of the technical, for me, the hard part was figuring out uh, how I was going to get into these bosses and some of these um, um, you know, steeper areas. Um, presumably, you could get a cutter that's really, really, really long, right? Uh, the problem with that is um, they flop around a lot. Uh, and they're not very rigid, so the surface finishes that you get are really not that good. Um, and there's also, all, you know, always a chance that with something that long that you break it. So um, typically, the way I hold a part is with what's called a collet, and this is one of those uh, holders. You've got the holder itself, you've got a nut that holds the collet in place, and then you've got a cutter. Uh, but this is really rather uh, large in diameter, so if you wanted to get into uh, something like this, you, you can't, you can't, you can't get in there, you can't get into the shoulder. And if you're, let's say, trying to mill these, this lettering, uh, it's, no, not going to happen. Also, the case here uh, in this boss, uh, you can't, uh, you just, no, you can't get at this. The, this nut hits the part, uh, and when this thing's spinning at 7,500 or 5,000 RPM, <laughs> That's bad news. So um, I needed to find an alternative for this. And what I ended up using um, was what's called a shrink fit holder. And essentially, this is what it looks like. And, and this is an interesting, interesting idea. What you've got here um, is you've got a little piece of metal, essentially a metal tube with a hole. And then you've got a cutter. And what, you've do what uh, is done is you heat up this part. And so it expands, and the hole in the center expands as well. And then you put the cutter in. Now, it doesn't have to expand a lot. Um, you may be looking at two to, th what, four ten thousandths of an inch? Four ten thousandths of an inch. And just think about that. Um, and, um, so, and these parts are made from different materials. So this is steel, and this happens to be tungsten carbide. And they expand at different rates, so if you reheat this, uh, it'll expand faster than that, so you're able to put the cutter out and you reuse it, but okay. Anyway, um, so I was able to get around um, the clearance issue by using one of these types of cutters, and 
that became really important when I was doing the, the lettering. Um, and the lettering is an interesting idea because I used a very, very small end mill for that. I used a 3 64ths end mill. Think about that, spinning at 9,000 RPM to, to get these letters. Um, so, wow, 9 64ths. Think about what it takes to make that. That's crazy. That's, I think that's, I, I think that's amazing. At any rate, uh, that's just me geeking out. Um, so th those are some of the things that uh, I had to figure out and I, I was able to use to, uh, to get this uh, part made. All right, so next step, uh, I need to uh, clean the surface up. Even though it looks shiny and new, um, it's really not that smooth. If you, you run your finger around it, you can feel some grooves on it. And um, I just end up um, cleaning it up with sandpaper, just like you would a piece of wood. I'll just take progressively um, finer and finer grits of sandpaper and uh, start polishing this thing. With the, um, and the idea really is that uh, I, I want these surfaces nice and smooth so that um, when they're injected with wax, the wax has nothing to grab onto. Um, the particular surface finish is eh, not that critical because the investment casting process um, will still probably leave the, the part rougher than uh, the waxes are when, that I give to the foundry. But I do want this really easy to use uh, and I don't want anything the wax, you know, hanging up into the, the metal. And the silicone parts, if something got hung up, I just <laughs> torque it and uh, the, the wax will just pop out. I can't do this with the uh, aluminum. There's no torquing it. If it's stuck on the metal part, it'll get really hard to remove. So I want to minimize that. So, some work to do. So here's the surface of that uh, part as it came off the machine. And you can see some gouge lines and such in the picture, uh, that line running through the picture is one of my hairs. That's uh, three thousandths of an inch thick. I actually measured it with a micrometer. Um, and you know, the the process for cleaning this up is the same as you would uh, use in a piece of wood. You just sort of um, refine the surface with finer and finer grits of sandpaper, which is what I did. So I established a um, base uh, by cleaning out as many of those gouges as I could with one hundred and eighty grit paper and then just move to finer grids, uh, you know, like a 220 or a 300, a 400, and uh, I settled on a, a 600 grit finish, which is um, what you've got here, picture of that. Again, that uh, line on the right is one of my hairs, it's 3,000 of an inch thick. And the surface is uh, now pretty smooth and flat, uh, I'm fairly happy with it, and uh, I'm going to leave it there. Okay. Yeah, I've got all the, the well, surfaces cleaned up here. Um, this, this everything's smoother. It may not look as shiny and new as it did before, but uh, it's a lot smoother. Um, and uh, it's helped me with the, the injection. So uh, what ends up happening here is I take this. Let's see. How does that go? How does that go? Why am I asking you that? How do you? How are you supposed to know? I'm supposed to be the one showing you, right? Okay, so I think it's this way, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. And on the back, there's a, an injection port, uh, the matching back plate, and I got some uh, screws. Uh, screw the screw everything together, like as so. And then we've got. Uh, with some big screws, you need a big screwdriver, right? Yeah, see? Holds everything together, like so. And then, uh, let's see, wax goes in there. Uh, and it fills the cavity with uh, mold. With mold. What am I saying? Not mold, with wax. Fill the mold with wax. And um, this is the first part that I injected. Didn't inject all the way, but uh, that's okay. I just kept trying at it working at it. Uh, here's another one. Uh, looks a little better. Here's one that, uh, well, they got stuck. I had to pull it out. Uh, at any rate, I ended up abandoning the, uh, the pink wax. I went to a greener one and, and I got some pretty consistent results with this. Uh, this one looks pretty nice. Um, it still has some problems with it, uh, but that's okay. Um, we'll fix those. The mold works. Um, need to play around with uh, some of the, uh, like the, the 
the temperatures, maybe the wax injection temperature, um, the mold temperature, uh, just to make this uh, more efficient and work better so the waxes don't have any problems. So, but we'll save that for a different video. Um, uh, in the end, here it is, and it's a wonderful aluminum glory, my, my new mold for uh, the stainless steel aluminum back. So we'll see you on the next video.